Hey guys, welcome back. Our project today is to try to fix this instrument panel on my rollback truck. It's a 91 Volvo WG42 or, or white GMC42, whichever you like. So the instrument cluster's had problems for a while now. The odometer and all this stuff in this LCD display doesn't work. And the speedometer typically doesn't work. But other than that, the, the rest of the panel has been working fine. But I'll show you what happens now. So you turn the key on. And you get the buzzer, and you get the seat belt light, and the engine fluids light. And as far as I know, that seat belt light's just on a timer. It should go out on its own, but it's stuck on all the time. And then the buzzer should be on right now because the air pressure is low. But even when the air pressure is above the threshold, the buzzer stays on all the time. And then the tack is stuck at like 700 RPM and it does nothing. The speedometer doesn't even try to work. Uh, everything else over here on this side is working. The voltmeter, the water temperature, and the oil pressure. They must be independently powered because those are all working fine. The fuel level gauge also not working correctly, but the air pressure gauge is. Whatever the latest failure is with the instrument cluster, it happened while I was on the road. So I just popped the fuse out of the fuse panel down here and killed the power to the, the whole cluster. I mean, none of the gauges are working anyway, so there's no reason to leave it powered up, and the buzzer just absolutely drives me crazy. So we got to fix it and uh, figure out figure out maybe some of the other problems too. If we can get this odometer and speedometer working, that would be a good thing. I mean, speeding's not really an option in this truck, but it might be kind of nice to know how many miles we're driving. Well, guys, I can't remember where we left off. Time has gotten away from me. This is the main board out of the instrument panel from my rollback truck. And I had some video of you know showing this instrument panel not working and you know removing it from the truck. I think there's a reasonable chance I may have deleted that, so if that's the case, let me catch you guys up. And I've been trying to figure out how to fix this board, and I don't think I'm going to be able to. So let me show you what happens. I'll just power on this board real quick. So I don't have the power hooked up to the odometer feed, which would cause the buzzer to come on because it's just going to drive us crazy. But the important part is that the seat belt light is on and the engine fluid light is on, even though none of the actual sensors are connected to the board. And I was looking at the service manual right here, you guys probably won't be able to read it, but it's telling me this section here is about the telltale lamps. And it says seat belt and it's actuated or activated by internal electronics. If a new bulb doesn't solve the problem, change the main board, that's this board. And then the engine fluids light. So it basically says there's several different switches and sensors that can cause it to come on. But basically if the light stays on, but the buzzer indicates normal condition, and there are no diagnostic messages, change the board. Well this doesn't have diagnostic messages, this is an older truck. It doesn't have a data link uh, to the engine computer because there is no engine computer but anyway what it's telling us is that this board internally has a problem and it's causing these lights to be on and it's causing basically causing everything to not work so the board itself is pretty simple but I cannot get anywhere as far as fixing it so it looks like the problem is probably right here this chip it just says Intel 1980 Signetics and then there's a bunch of numbers up here. It's got to be some kind of a microprocessor chip. I can't find any information about it whatsoever. None of these numbers right here seem to correspond with anything. If I look up this Intel 1980 and Signetics, it goes to some like 2650 style microprocessors, but I can't find a reliable pinout that even tells me what, you know, what's going on, what the power and ground would be or the oscillator or anything like that. So I don't know if we're going to have any luck fixing it. And I did trace through the circuit. I know for certain that the seat belt light, it's controlled by this transistor, which is directly controlled by this pin of this microcontroller. So if that's on, I think that's a good clue that this microcontroller is, is totally not working. And I don't think we have any chance of fixing that. It probably runs an onboard program and that program could be corrupted or whatever. Even if it's not corrupted, we have zero chance of getting it out of there without a pinout. So I think we're hooped. So I think we're kind of in the in the no one to fold them category here. I mean the board itself is pretty simple. I think these 
these switches right here are probably for calibration of the speedometer and the tack and then most of these ICs that you see here are just voltage comparing chips which are probably used to set I don't know various warning lights based on the position of the gauges I don't know there's a big you know FET chip here with the uh, heat sink on the back and then a, a big diode on the front that's associated with that I think that's probably to do with the dimmer for the backlight of the instrument panel that doesn't work either and I haven't been able to figure out what's going on with that this little switch right here is supposed to dim the lights that's never worked correctly so yeah I think the problems are just too great we're gonna have to we're gonna have to toss it I can't buy this board it doesn't exist I can't find anybody that will fix it there are companies out there that will fix the data link style but this is just too old so yeah, I think we've got to go a different direction. Alright, let's take a quick look at this microprocessor here with the scope. Like I said, I don't have a pin out, so I don't know what's going on, but you can see that this pin right here that I know controls the seat belt light looks like it's being pulled low, so it's only like 800 millivolts right now must be low enough below the threshold to pull in that NPN transistor and then what I would assume would be power appears to have 5 volts right there and then I would assume that this is the ground and it appears to be at 0 volts and then if I go 3 pins in we have some kind of a clock type of a input or output right here on this pin 12 megahertz so I don't know, I couldn't find any data that corresponds to a Signetics chip having a 12 micro or 12 megahertz frequency, but maybe it does something else that I'm not aware of. So all the other chips are either high or low. Or sorry. So all the other pins are either high or low. There's there's no action on any other pin except for, you know, that one's pretty noisy. But yeah, this one right here is the only one that has anything significant going on. So it's not dead, but it just doesn't seem to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. And there's, you know, there's no information about this board. It's 30 years old. So I think we're on our own. So here's the plan. I'm going to buy my way out of this problem. I have purchased all new universal gauges, some signal warning lights and a buzzer and various components. And we're going to make an entirely new instrument panel. I just don't see any way to save the old one. Now luckily this is an entirely mechanical engine so there's no reason that we can't just build our own instrument panel and move on with life. It's not like we had to communicate with a, an engine ECU and you know decode some SAE protocol communication. We just hook up some wires and away we go. Now it's not going to be super simple because I started making a kind of a diagram here. The problem is that there's certain sensors inside of the, you know, certain sensors have to turn on the buzzer and some of them are sourcing and some of them are syncing. So we'll deal with that part in a minute. The gauges are a little bit tricky to come up with. Some of these are new old stock that I bought off of eBay and the new ones here I bought from Summit. They're all VDO brand and I don't know if they're any better or worse than anybody else's gauges. They seem to be made, you know, various places, India, China, some of them say USA. I don't know if they're really made here or not. Doesn't really matter. They're all kind of crazy expensive. And the other problem that I have is that almost all of these aftermarket gauges are designed for like hot rods or whatever. So every speedometer is a 180 mile an hour speedometer and every tack is an 8,000 or 10,000 RPM tachometer. Well, let me tell you, if this L10 Cummins is going 8,000 RPM, we got some serious, serious problems. So I found this company VDO makes a 3000 RPM tack. That'll be just right for us. The original one's actually only 2500 RPM maximum. And then a 120 mile an hour speedometer. The other thing I wanted was a mechanical oil pressure gauge. So that's just a regular old Bordon tube gauge that uses a, a, a line straight out of the engine oil manifold. That's what was in there originally. And then we're going to have to change out the, the water temperature sensor because the new gauge comes with its own, its own resistance range. 
So I'll have to figure that out. I, I don't think the original one works anyway. The, well, the water temperature gauge was never correct. And then the fuel pressure gauge, there's multiple different options on that. As, as far as I can tell from the service information I have, the manual that I have says it takes a standard GM 33 to 240 ohm sending unit. So that's what I bought and this should work with our existing sending unit. And then the other thing that's kind of hard to come up with is we need an air pressure gauge. So this truck has a dual system, primary and secondary air, so this is a dual reading mechanical air pressure gauge. So in case you're curious, these are all cockpit style gauges from VDO. And you know it doesn't really matter. I kind of wanted the tack and the speedometer to be the same, and then it would be nice if the other smaller gauges all kind of matched. You know, aesthetics is very important around here. And then as far as the warning lights go, I got these from Summit too. So I got two turn signal type warning lights. You probably can't see that. They're just little LEDs. And then one of them's like a, a red. One of them's a check oil. And then. I don't know, some other various stuff. And then I got two little bitty LEDs. These are going to be, one's going to be for my battery warning light and one's going to be for my low pressure, air pressure warning light. So hopefully I can pull enough amps through that to turn on the, the voltage regulator. I guess we'll figure that out when we get to it. And then this is the buzzer that I've got. It's slightly louder and it operates at a slightly more annoying frequency than the old buzzer. So I may have to come up with some kind of a muffler to go over it because I didn't want to buy eight different buzzers before I found the right one. So I took a big fat guess, got pretty close. All right, guys, we're getting back on this instrument panel. I can't remember where we left off. I wish I could just, you know, work on one thing and focus on that straight through, but it never seems to work out that way. Anyway, this is the new instrument panel right here. I had it cut out of a piece of steel. This happens to be 14 gauge, which is a little bit overkill but it's what they had so we'll take what we can get and basically I traded some some power stroke engine parts to a guy who owns a CNC plasma cutter so I just drew up what I wanted real quick in the CAD program sent him over a DXF file he burned one out it was a little bit wrong the holes were way too small uh, we doctored it up I sent it back over to him and this is what we have and everything looks pretty good. I drilled the holes here for the the warning lights using a, a rotary brooch and then there's a couple of small LEDs that are going to go here and here. One for the low air pressure and one for the battery and then just mounting holes on the outside. And the original one had countersunk holes for the mounts. I'm not going to do that. It doesn't bother me at all if the, the screw heads stick up above the panel. You know, it's just an old truck. Anyway, I'm going to throw this together and we'll talk about wiring. Alright guys, I think I've got this whole instrument panel pretty well assembled. I'll give you a little mini tour of the pretty side. So we've got a voltmeter, water temperature, oil pressure, speedometer, tack, fuel level, and a dual reading air pressure gauge. There's a small LED here, that's for your low air pressure warning light. Small LED here, that's for your battery warning light. Left turn signal, right turn signal. This is a warning light here for the low coolant. This is a warning light for an air filter restriction and that's a, war a indicator light for high beams. Now, let's take a look at the scary side. Yeah, that. Pretty well a rat's nest. But, it takes a lot of wires to make a lot of gauges work. And I ran everything down here to a terminal strip, and that's how I'm going to connect it to the existing wiring in the truck. 
So let me walk you guys through the wiring real quick. This is a wiring diagram that I made and it's just as messy as the actual wiring. There's a, a few things going on here. But basically I split everything out. These are the inputs that are coming into the instrument cluster. And if you're not familiar with how big trucks are wired, it's a little different than cars. Typically they do not use you know, multiple different colors of wire like what you would see in a car. Typically in trucks, almost all the wires are the same color and then they're actually labeled with a number. On, usually it's printed right on the insulation itself. Sometimes there's little tags. That's more like how we would see it in industrial type equipment. So no big deal. And I went ahead and labeled all the wires here where they come into the terminal strip. And this white thing here is actually the back of the original instrument panel. I need it anyway because I need a spacer to make up the correct thickness. But it makes a convenient place to mount these terminal strips and relays and the buzzer and stuff. These blue and red wires that you see here, that's all for the backlighting. So in addition to the backlighting, each gauge also requires a power and a ground that would be controlled by the ignition switch. And you'll see it here, it's the green and the black wire and all the gauges are hooked up in parallel. But the water and fuel level require a actual sense wire. The speedometer requires a sense and a ground from the sensor and then the tack just requires a sense input. We'll see how that works. Anyway, that part of the wiring is, is fairly straightforward. Alright, so the only part of the wiring that's a little bit confusing has to do with the buzzer and that's because the buzzer has four different inputs basically that are required to turn it on. So the low air, the low coolant, the left turn, and the right turn. So if you're not familiar with these big trucks, uh, typically speaking, they do not have automatic canceling turn signals. At least I can only think of one truck I've ever driven that had automatically canceling turn signals, and that was a Sterling. Anyway, the so the left hand turn and the right hand turn and the hazards will both need to will all need to turn on the buzzer, and that's because you know it's so loud in the truck you'll forget to turn them off if you don't have an audible buzzer to remind you. And the problem is that the left turn and right turn are sourcing inputs. So basically when you turn the right hand turn signal on you get 12 volts supplied to the cluster. Whereas with the low air and the low coolant, when those sensors or switches are closed, they actually short to ground. So in order to reconcile the difference in how the switches work, I just used a relay. So basically what happens here is when the low air or the low coolant switches close, it completes the circuit to ground here through the buzzer and the buzzer can, can go off. Now when you turn the right hand or the left hand turn signal, that's going to power up the coil of a relay and when the coil powers up it closes and it basically completes a circuit to ground. So the other tricky part of this is we also need to have a couple of diodes because these switches are hooked up in parallel. So what would happen if we didn't have the diode is if the low air pressure switch closed, it would turn on the buzzer, but it would also back feed through this circuit and it would turn on the warning light for the low coolant. So in order to prevent that from happening, we use a diode here so that the, basically the current can only flow in one direction. That way, the only way that it can, the current can flow through this circuit is if the actual switch is closed. Same thing with the, light, the left hand and right hand turns. So if we didn't have this diode right here blocking the path, whenever we turn the right hand turn signal on, it would back feed through this and turn on the right hand turn signal bulb. So you know, if we were making a few thousand of these, we'd just print up a, a little circuit board, use a couple transistors, a couple of diodes, and you know, for 10 cents worth of parts, we'd have all the functions that we needed. But for a single board or a single application like this, it's cheaper just to buy a relay. Relay is about five bucks, and a couple of through-hole diodes. Wire them up in in the terminal strip right here. The buzzer is mounted on the back side here. So all in for maybe eight or nine dollars worth of components, we can we can build this logic into our circuit, and we don't have to have a, a separate warning buzzer for every function. Clear as mud. Yeah. So anyway, once I get the thing installed and I'm sure that everything works, we'll take care of this rat's nest and we'll, we'll pretty this all up. 
So don't worry about that. Okay, so here's the wiring harness for the old instrument cluster. We got plenty of slack here to do whatever we want to do. So I'll try to show you guys. Can you see this? Right there where it says 140. That's how the circuit numbers are labeled on the wire. They're usually just printed right on the insulation. So you see that one says 202. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and cut these wires right here at these plugs and strip the ones that we need to strip and then we'll just cover the other ones with some shrink wrap and we'll be done with it. Now don't just go clipping all these wires at the same time because even though the ignition the key is off basically there's a chance one of these wires is hot. Alrighty, I think we're all wired in here. So these wires here are not going to be used. Now I'll have to make sure that there's not something that gets fed out of the panel you know that's going to be affected by this but I think looking at the wiring diagram there's nothing it all just comes into the panel and that's it so I think the next step is to fire it up and see what works and what doesn't work and try to avoid an electrical fire and hopefully we'll have a bit of an upgrade over my current instrument panel which looks about like this all right, I'm trying to figure out the tachometer here, and I don't think it's going to be compatible with the sensor that I have. So it says in the sheet here that it can go up to 25 pulses per revolution. And I just took the scope up here to the tach output. This is the signal that comes out of it. So it's like 880 microseconds between, you know, that's the period of the wave here. And so like 1.1 kilohertz. Anyway, so I figure if it's 800 RPM at idle, that's about 14 revolutions per second. So I think if I did the math right, it's putting out about 80 pulses per revolution. So I don't know if that's going to work with this, with this tag. So let me think about that for a minute. Okay, it looks like my alternator does have a tack output. And it looks like it's putting out 12 pulses per Per revolution or 13 pulses per revolution right now so I think that'll work we'll have to run a new wire out to the tack the only concern I have is that it's it's full voltage so hopefully this little tack can handle 15 volts in input I think it should all right proof of concept that's my test lead clipped into what I think is the tack output of the alternator I'm using this 10 foot retractable test lead Thing is super handy for stuff like this and I've got the other end clipped into the back side of my tech so let's fire up and see what what happens here all right we got something I'll have to fine-tune it but at least it's working cool and then my my high beam light is wired up wrong I gotta switch that one around fuel gauge seems to work I haven't hooked up the air or the oil pressure voltmeter works Battery warning light works, low air warning light works, uh, my turn signals are working. Alright guys, it's getting late in the day. The mosquitoes are starting to move in. Just makes it miserable to work down here. We've had so much flooding that the, <laughs> the mosquitoes are just running rampant. Anyway, we've got a few things working and we got a few things to figure out still. So I think we can make the tack work off the alternator. And you know the voltmeter is working. I think the water temperature gauge is working. This truck probably needs a thermostat. It never really gets warmed up. The fuel gauge is working. I'm sure the oil pressure and air pressure gauges will work. We're going to have to figure out the speedometer next time. So that may be a little bit involved. And we're going to have to figure out how to run the wiring down to the alternator for that tack. So yeah, a few things to do. But I think we'll stop here as the end of part one. And we'll pick it up again in part two. And I'll see you guys there.